So good evening, everyone. The plan for tonight is to share an algorithm for management of distal radius fractures. And this should be easy because we've known about this fracture for over 200 years. The problem we have <clears throat> is to get the next slide. Just click, click it again, Tommy. It's bouncing. Okay. So the, the holy grail of radius fractures is to somehow try to predict the outcome. And we know there are some certain risk factors, starting with the patient themselves. There are H, H problems, H factors. There are concomitant injuries, socioeconomic consequences of the injury. We obviously have the fracture, what type of fracture it is, comminution, displacement, etc. And we consequently have <clears throat> the problem with treatment, which means that we need to decide how to retain a reduction, how to fix things, what kind of complications may occur. And this is why the algorithm is a plan to try to understand this. And as you can see, this is a blank canvas at the start of this evening. We're gonna fill each box to go through what is an evidence-based algorithm to follow every individual through this algorithm. So this started early in the 2000s in south of Sweden, where I was working at the time. And we had a distal radius study group that worked for about two years to set up what we felt was as good evidence there is to help all surgeons in the south of Sweden to operate and manage these patients without surgery as well. So the Lund group published 2008 in Acta Orthopedica Scandinavia, the results of the first trial of this modified flow chart. And modified means that they introduced something we hadn't discussed in detail in the study group. So they introduced, for instance, high energy trauma and highly community fractures as a separate entity that went immediately to some sort of operative intervention, which is most likely fair. They also had a mistake in my view, and that is where we have gone different routes. And that is that they didn't differ in between osteoporotic patients and younger non-osteoporotic patients where the fracture most often represents a high energy trauma of some sort. So this was the modified flow chart that they adapted and tried in Lund. So they entered 518 patients out of 581 that was officially eligible. And this was, as I said, in Lund, Sweden. They used DASH as an outcome instrument and found that the worst group of a DASH of 12 were in the reduced non-operated fractures, i.e. displaced fractures that didn't go to surgery that was left after reduction with non-operative management. The six operated, <coughs> sorry, the operated patients had a dash of six and they represent 25% of the study group. And they were almost as good as the fractures that were undisplaced, suggesting that an operative in intervention in selected patients give you almost as good outcome as if you have an undisplaced fracture. And they also noted that the DASH outcome was dependent on the age, obviously osteoporotic patients faring worse. So the modified algorithm that I present tonight is taking more responsibility for the difference in between osteoporotic and non-osteoporotic patients and subdivides the group slightly tighter than what we did in Sweden almost 20 years ago. So if you look at the surgeon's perspective, a surgeon wants to find the boxes where he or she can operate. So as you see on this slide, you jump from displaced fractures into the surgical boxes, and perhaps a keen surgeon even disregards the other boxes. As a doctor, we have to look at all boxes. We have to look at all consequences and make sure that we don't miss anything. Our therapists, they want to see when they can be useful and help us, not only triaging some of these injuries, but managing some of the complications we have with swelling and pain. 
So this is the scenario. We are now in A&E and we have a distal radius fracture. This is a quite common history that we have a slightly elderly woman falling on icy ground and getting this fracture that just on a quick look looks like it's extra articular, it's displaced. And it looks actually quite messy. So here starts the sad adventure and journey that we have insufficient evidence regarding quite a few things. So when it comes to anesthesia, whilst we reduce this displaced fracture, there's some weak evidence for intravenous regional anesthesia, but there is no evidence which type of reduction we should use. So this is what happens, and you can see on the left slide that there's a, a venflon for the intravenous regional anesthesia, and it's basically a pulling exercise. Some people even use a fulcrum of some sort to reduce the fracture. But what we don't want is a patient coming from a &E with an extreme flexion or ulnar deviation of the wrist as on the right hand slide. That is the starting point to a disaster. It's also debatable whether manipulation in patients over 65 with moderate displacement has any merit, but again, insufficient evidence. So if you look at the fracture clinic in the first week <clears throat> and the patients have had either a close reduction in any because of a displaced fracture, or they present with a minimally displaced fracture, which is an ulnar plus variance less than one millimeter. So it's important in that fracture clinic to know that classifications, they do not work. They cannot be reproduced, not even in between one radiologist one week apart or different radiologists, and they don't correlate with the outcome. So in spite of a, a multitude of classifications, look at the fracture and describe the fracture as accurately as you can when you communicate. So what we look at is the so-called radial tilt, which varies in between zero degree, which means that the radial joint surface is neutral to the axis, or down to 20 degrees of palmar tilt. So we therefore present either a dorsal or a volar angulation. We also talk about radial inclination, which is the distance from the tip of the radial styloid down to the point of the most ulnar part of the radius. And this inclination varies in between 15 to 25 degrees. We also measure the ulnar variance, which in this illustration is zero, as the ulnar head is as long as the radius. But in reference levels, it can vary from minus four to plus two millimeters. And of course, if you are in any doubt, you might have to request a contralateral x-ray to identify how much is a, is a personal difference from reference levels into what is pathological because of the fracture. We then have something I call fracture personality. And that is what the patient is not telling us, but the x-ray is. So what we look at, for instance, if we look at a biomechanical perspective, we have all learned about the volar line of Lewis, which just shows that the axis in between the head of the capitate through the lunate goes through the volar cortex of the radius. Hence, a volar lip partial fracture is highly unstable. If you look at the volar cortex in a slightly different view, you can see on this trauma film that the volar cortex is not hinged, it is overlapping. And in spite of a good effort of reduction, the post-reduction film shows that the cortices are still not engaged, causing a highly degree of instability. And this is what you can see for yourself in the trauma clinic and the fracture clinic. And this is something we call fracture personality. The fracture personality can also be the amount of comminution, and whether comminution is more palmar, dorsal, intraarticular, going into the distal radial joint. And that is something we all need to look at and take a critical view at in order to know how to manage that individual. We also have sometimes fracture patterns that causes a high risk of associated injury. So this is a radial styloid fracture, which is also called a Schofer's fracture, that tips the radial styloid. And as you can see on the left-hand slide, the scaphoid has a ring sign and there's a widening in between the scaphoid and the lunate, 
suggested that this is actually part of an incomplete greater arc perilunate dislocation, but without the dislocation. The CT scan helps you to see the exit points. And you see that there has been a combined radius fracture and an ulnar stylog fracture. And this is something we always need to bear in mind that the fracture might represent the tip of the iceberg and what lies underneath it is for us to identify. And in help with that, uh, Lou Gilula formulated the three Gilula lines where the first proximal line of the proximal row is the first Gilula line. The second Gilula line is the distal part of the proximal row. And the third Gilula line is the proximal part of the distal row. And they should all be in harmony. If there's any step or gap, it suggests a, an intraosseous or soft tissue ligamentous injury that might need further attention. If we look at the anastyloid, it represents either, as you see on the top drawing, a collateral ligament type of injury where the TFCC, which is the radio ulna ligament from the radius to the tip of the styloid and to the depth of the fovea, might be more or less involved. The second schematic viewing shows that the base of the styloid may still not be involving the foveal fibers, but the last slide shows that a base of ulnar styloid fracture, which is displaced more than two millimeters, is highly likely to engage the entire TFCC, causing distal radial ulnar joint instability and needs further management or at least discussion of it. We also need to discuss what is a radius fracture and when is it part of something more complex. So by all means, the left slide here or the left image here shows a radius fracture, but you also note the ulna fracture and you also note on both images the scaphoid fracture. So this is therefore a distal forearm fracture complicated with an intercarpal fracture and should not be brought into the algorithm of radius fractures because this should start another thought process and management process in your own fracture clinics. Similarly, this is a radiocarpal fracture dislocation, where you can see that the palmar lip of the radius is not fractured. So this is what Fernandez called a shear fracture, where the entire corpus has sheared off the dorsal part of the radius. And as you can see on the right image, the anastyloid is two centimeters down the forearm because of the magnitude at impact. And again, although partly the radius has been fractured, this has to be managed as a radiocarpal fracture dislocation and is therefore not part of the algorithm. We then talk about patient personality because every patient is an individual and needs therefore a tailor-made treatment. So we need to ask ourselves, what is a gold standard patient? Ask for yourself. We need to look at, is it an osteoporotic type of fracture and patient? Are there comorbidities of significance? What's the hand dominance? What kind of profession is this patient doing? And what kind of hobbies do we need to put into account to get a more holistic view of the patient being the person behind the fracture? We also need to scrutinize ourselves and ask, Am I a doctor, a surgeon, and what kind of personality am I? Am I the type who is evidence-based or am I more eminence-based? And if you ask Carlos, we are all eminence-based. And that comes down, looking at all these different factors into some sort of treatment, which is part of the management we look for in the algorithm to find out what does the fracture personality, patient personality, and our own personality build into how we treat this patient. So if we go back to the fracture clinic and we start with the first group of patients coming with a minimally displaced fracture, which is an ulna plus less than one millimeter, it can thereafter have a slightly dorsal tendency, but less than five degrees of dorsal angulation or less than 20 degrees of volar angulation. And for those patients, there's strong evidence to use a plaster for three to four weeks. Practically, we can remove the, that plaster in a nurse-led clinic, and these patients fare well with just a home exercise program. 
So again, sadly, if you scrutinize the biggest studies, conservative management is debatable in many ways, but there is some support that the slab is better than a cost, and there's some weak evidence for splints. But again, in this group, there is again little evidence for what we do. So basically, a small cast or a plaster below the elbow, three weeks has been proven to be sufficient. Most people bail out on that one and still wants four weeks. But scientifically, there's evidence that three weeks would be sufficient for these minimally displaced fractures. Sadly, for all our therapists and partly for ourselves, the Cochrane meta analysis gives no support and evidence for any rehabilitation during immobilization or rehabilitation after immobilization. And this is purely based on scientific studies and is far from my practical experience where therapists are key workers, core workers to help all our patients through our healthcare system. So the BSSH formulated some guidelines and this is British Society for Surgery of the Hand, where they stated that therapy is indicated when disproportionate levels of pain, edema and loss of motion is present, or when there is a delayed functional recovery. So BSAs supported my views and most people's views that we do need therapy, although the Cochrane meta-analysis give us a very weak evidence for that. So if we then go back to the fracture clinic and we look at the displaced fractures being either dorsal or volar, if we start with the volar fractures being more than 20 degrees, we enter the first surgical box. And as we now know, after having discussed the biomechanics with the volar line of Lewis, if we don't treat these patients operatively, there will be a palmar carpal subluxation of significant importance. And because all the forces here are on the palmar aspect with your flexion and so on, these needs to be fixed. And the principle many, many years ago was a standard AO plate that was pre-bent for the volar lip. Nowadays, more the volar locking plates have taken over, but it's, it's very few people discussing and debating the treatment of these volarly displaced fractures. So then we've continued with the um, aftermath of that. We, we use a plaster in spite of the operation. My view is use a plaster to let the, set, let the injury and procedures settle for about four weeks. Uh, let them see the therapist and bring them back for a follow-up in about eight weeks time. The crucial part of the displaced dorsal fractures is to identify what kind of patient do we have here? What kind of bone stock do we have here? And these are called osteoporotic type or non-osteoporotic type. For the osteoporotic type, sadly for women, already at the age of 55, we have a risk of clinical osteoporosis. For men, it's about 65. We also add the word biologically old or inactive because there are individuals already before this age span might have had serious medical issues and therefore behave more like an osteoporotic type. So it's important for us to see this difference and decide which of the boxes we follow for the patient. So it's quite clear that without densitometry, we have these clinical osteoporotic age groups at 55 and 65. When I did my PhD 20 years ago, the age groups were similarly 50 and 60 respectively. So if you look at these two images, you can see the clear difference from the sad woman with rheumatoid arthritis presenting with a radius fracture. And I guess radius fracture here is the least of her problems. And then we have the other counterpart, which is someone coming off a motorcycle accident and presented with a high-ended trauma in non-osteoporotic bone stock. We also know that there's a quite big difference in these two patient groups. So with incidence, the non-osteoporotic patients are very few compared to the big bulk of osteoporotic uh, fractures. We also know that in the younger age group, men and women fracture equally often as opposed to the osteoporotic group, which is predominantly women. We also know that the degree of trauma is severe in the non-osteoporotic group as opposed to the osteoporotic group 
and there's a minor slip on icy grounds. We also know that the non osteoporotic fractures are mainly intraarticular, as opposed to the mainly extraarticular for the osteoporotic group. We also know that they have different prognostic factors. So the Anaplas various variance is in the, in the non osteoporotic patients only two millimeter before they get a worse outcome, and in osteoporotic patients is four to five millimeters. We also talk a lot about joint incongruency to avoid secondary arthrosis, and Nurk and Jupiter talked about two millimeter, but most people are guided by one millimeter. But we have to ask ourselves if the osteoporotic person is dependent on secondary or primary arthrosis, if that is one of the key prognostic factors. So if we then start with the dorsally displaced fractures in an osteoporotic type of patient, where the anaplas is less than the four millimeter we just talked about, and less than dorsal angulation of 20 degrees, we follow them up in about two weeks time and we allow them a collis class to avoid any edema, swelling and pain. If the situation at that point is unchanged, we allow them to keep the plaster for four weeks and they go into similar management as the minimally displaced fractures. This is an example of a acceptable displacement on the trauma film. And as you can see, this person already presents with STT arthritis, suggesting that it is a completely different ball game. And as you can see, after reduction, the volar cortex is nicely hinged. It seems to be a basically two fragment fracture that can be treated conservatively without any risks. So if we look at the big meat analysis, the non-operative treatment versus surgical treatment has some weak evidence for non-operative treatment in patients over 65. So again, going back to the previous discussion, we have a cast of plaster below the elbow. We use it for possibly three in this group, most likely four weeks because it was initially displaced and then we can move into a splint at night. If we at the two week follow-up after trauma have a redisplacement of the fracture pattern, where redisplacement is related to comminution, age, and the ulnar variance on the initial radiographs, which again goes back to the fracture clinic a week earlier, where we should have identified the degree of comminution. We should have identified the age of the patient, and we should have identified the ulnar plus variance. So here in a way, we have a second chance to take a good decision what we do with the redisplacement. But in all fairness, already at the fracture clinic, these things should have been picked up and discussed in the management. Now, what's the relation with remanipulation? There is no use for remanipulation. It's strong support that we shouldn't remanipulate, but sadly, the scientific evidence is not there. So if we have redisplacement after two weeks, then the algorithm suggests surgery. And again, going back to this meta-analysis where they said there's a weak evidence for non-surgical treatment, the BSSH took this on board and stated 2018, in patients 65 years of age or older, other factors such as pre-injury function, medical comorbidities and fracture characteristics should be considered and options discussed with the patient. So this is where the weak evidence for non-operative treatment and the insufficient evidence that surgery is the right way forward is for us a reason not to just jump into the surgical box because that's what we do really good. We should discuss this with the patient. And if we look at surgery in osteoporotic patients, there is no difference in between non-operative treatment and surgery, external fixator, open reduction internal fixation, or even KYs versus open reduction internal fixation. And these are good solid studies, and therefore we should really question ourselves before we move into the surgical box. So this is a situation where I've raised a couple of question marks, and the Montgomery case in the UK makes it very important to have a fair and honest discussion with the patient at this point. One practical problem is that we are in a very busy 
clinic where patients come and go very fast and to stop and discuss this fairly with the patient becomes an issue that we do have to do it. We have to respect the patient. We have to present the weak evidence and the lack of evidence and then take a decision whether to operate or actually leave it. So if we go down the surgical route, which is a natural response to an ulna plus more than four millimeter and dorsal angulation more than 20 degrees, then we enter the surgical box. If we look at the non osteoporotic type of, of patients, and we have run through previously that they are women less than 55, men less than 65 years of age, and they are biologically young or active. So for instance, a 75 year old mountaineer being out on a hike and falling over and fracturing his or her radius would be someone we would look into this box because it's a healthy, fit, active person over the, about, over the age of an osteoporosis is clinically present. And we look, look at the smaller degrees of changes, including joint incongruity. This is a group where we might request a CT scan with or without a three-dimensional reconstruction as suggested by the American group. The CT image on the image below shows a gap and not a step, which is a separate discussion that perhaps Wolfgang Hintringer will bring up next week. But this is debatable whether this is a one millimeter incongruency, whether the gap is not there uh, or whether there are steps which would be more contributing for a secondary arthrosis. So moving down into the follow-up uh, clinic in two weeks time, and if the uh, reduced position is still holding, then we keep the plaster in this group for five weeks. Plaster can come off in a nurse-led clinic, and we normally see them back in about two months time, because these patients are normally workers and might need extended sick leave, et cetera. If there's redisplacement, there's a strong um, evidence for surgery in this group. If patients present with an ulnar plus variance more than two millimeter, joint incongruency more than one millimeter, dorsal angulation more than 10 degrees, and radial angulation less than 10 degrees, they also enter the box. And in this particular group, it might be pertinent to introduce arthroscopy, which was discussed last week. And this is what you can see with a scope inside a fractured radius, where you might have impacted fragments, as you can see on the upper left image. You can see how the joint surface is cracked and how we, with a small little instrument, can elevate that fragment. And as you see on the lower image, how you can get the surface to be completely flush. When it comes to this age group, there's weak evidence for surgical management. But here we need to stop for a second and just discuss what is evidence. There's a study that compared cost versus external fixation, published 2006. Randomized controlled trial suggesting level one evidence, including 116 patients, which is a quite fair number, and they didn't see any significant difference two years after the fracture. So how would we rate a level one study, randomized controlled trial, with no difference. They actually raised themselves that recalculating the power for this study, they would have needed 1200 to show a difference. So this becomes a scientific statistical type two error where the sample size is too small to draw any conclusion at all. So when we look at this group as well, the, 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 the non osteoporotic patients, BSSH has guided us and said that if these fractures can be reduced closed, there's a role for KY fixation, which I think a lot of people initially, and when this study started more than roughly 10 years ago, it was raised as a big question mark if KY fixation was sufficient. So let's look at that study. So this was the so-called draft study, distal radius acute fracture fixation trial, sponsored by the National Institute for Health Research. It was a randomized controlled trial, which means that we are dealing with level one evidence, the best evidence there is. 
They compared KYS with open reduction internal fixation. It was a multi-center study. I think it was 18, 18 centers and they found no difference. So they drew the conclusion that KYS are cheaper. There's no need for plates and quote from their own conclusions. The results of this trial will reverse the trend towards locking plate fixation for this injury and will consequently save time and money for healthcare services around the world. So naturally, the National Institute for Health Research was jumping for joy that there was so much money to save. But let's scrutinize the study. They included 461 patients from 639 eligible. But they assessed initially 12,000 fractures and came to the exclusions that some of these fractures couldn't be reduced closed and were therefore excluded. Others were described that the fracture configuration was such that it was unsuitable to randomize. So what we have is a small group of radius fractures in the non osteoporotic group, where the BSSH recommended KY fixation if reducible closed, bearing in mind that that had to be with an accurate, appropriate fracture configuration. So if you look upon this, we have about 5% of the radius fractures that actually can be treated with KY fixation. And this is how a level Y evidence paper needs to be criticized and scrutinized. And this paper has been criticized. So the BSSH guided further that if it wasn't reducible closed, we again come to the big situation of insufficient evidence, what to do if we can't reduce it closed. But in all patients, including the non osteoporotic ones, there is some weak evidence that in these situations, open reduction internal fixation will be a better option than KYS, better option than external fixator, and better option than external fixator and KYS combined. And quite strong meta-analysis here to support that view. And after surgery, of course, we need to add physiotherapy, although there's no scientific strong support, but it's my clinical judgment that our therapists are there and they do a terrific job and they need to be on board in these complex fractures. So take on message. This is a, an evidence-based algorithm, but as you have noted, there are quite a few situations where evidence is not strong, it's possibly weak and sometimes insufficient. So in spite of this algorithm, we may struggle, but this algorithm is in my view, as good as it gets to direct your patient through all these boxes to find out what to do with this particular person. So find your appropriate pathway, look at all the boxes and decide where are we going. Predict the outcome by looking at these various factors. Look at the fracture personality. It is there on the x-ray, it's for you to find them and for, for me to find it, and then to take the appropriate measures. Look at the patient personality, who are we dealing with and what kind of life is this person living and what do they want to go back into? Look at the surgeon's personality and skills because there are so many various surgical treatment options if you go down that route. There are also people who are more cautious like I am and perhaps don't volunteer to operate even if it is my specialty to be a surgeon. And once you've done all this, tailor your treatment to these factors, fracture personality, patient personality, surgeon's personality, and do the best you can. Thank you.